Well, if you open your Bibles again, please, to the book of Ephesians and chapter 3, page 1174 of the Church Bibles, if you're using those. Well, I've had the, uh, the blessing and opportunity to preach. I've been working my way through Ephesians with you. Um, and just as a, a brief reminder, uh, you remember in chapter 1, we were looking at the amazing eternal love of God, his plan of salvation, that we're chosen if we're believers, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, loved with an everlasting love. Uh, Chapter 2, we were looking at how we were dead, the living dead, dead in trespasses and sins, walking according to the prince of the power of the air's will, doing the things that Satan wants us to do. The last thing we wanted to do, or had the power to do, was to live to please God. And by the grace of God, through faith alone, God brings us to know and to love him and to be his children, adopted into his family. And then last time we were looking at uh, the second part of chapter 2, where we considered how God in his grace, had brought the Jews and the Gentiles together as one church, one people, um, under Christ, in a way that was um, a great surprise, unfathomable to the Jews and the Gentiles, uh, a profound mystery, which we'll be touching on again briefly this evening. Uh, So tonight, the the passage, um, Ephesians 3, divides naturally into three sections. First is uh, verses 1 to 13, a mystery of grace. And then verses 14 to 19, a prayer for power. And then verses 20 and 21, a hymn of praise. So a mystery of grace. Last time we looked at how through the death of Christ... God had removed not only the sins of all who believe, but also that racial and religious dividing wall of hostility that existed in a very real way between the Jews and the Gentiles. And we learned that through uniting these two ancient enemies, through faith in Christ, God was creating a new humanity. That's a really important thing for us to get our heads around. That is what God is doing through the church, creating a new humanity, which he has called out from the old humanity. That's us, the church of Jesus Christ. And in these first 13 verses of chapter 3, Paul is explaining to the Ephesians that this truth about salvation coming to the Gentiles and they're being united with the Jews in a brand new faith community called the church was a profound mystery that was alluded to in the Old Testament but clearly revealed in the New, verses 2 to 6. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given to me for you. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, isn't he? That is the mystery, this thing that was hidden, that is now being revealed, brought out into the open. The mystery made known to me by revelation from the Lord, as I have already written briefly. In reading this, then, you will be able to understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to people in other generations as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to God's holy apostles and prophets. What is this mystery? It's that through the gospel... The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, we take these things for granted, don't we? It's not really a surprise to us. We know these things. We're very familiar with them. But as Paul is writing to the congregations he's addressing, this was huge. This was was of earth-shattering significance. This was... Such a significant event. How can Jews and Gentiles become a new humanity, live together in unity and peace and brotherhood 
when they'd been so divided previously. So Paul is saying, this is it. This is the mystery. This is what Christ is doing. He's bringing together Jews and Gentiles, enemies, to be one, a new humanity in Christ. And then he humbly highlights the fact that God used the foremost persecutor of the church, Paul himself, to substantially usher in this new administration, verses 7 and 8. I became a servant of this gospel by the gift of God's grace given me through the working of his power. Although I am less than the least of all the Lord's people, this grace was given me to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ. Paul knows he's not the man that he was by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. But he fully acknowledges who the pre-Christian Paul was. And that keeps him humble, doesn't it? Now I wonder, do we maintain that kind of balanced assessment of our own lives? Do we remember what we were before we knew Christ? Before his grace came to us, before we knew anything of the reality of the gospel, of the love of Christ. Because when we remember what we were and then realise what's happened and who we are now, we give God the glory. It helps us not to be proud, but to walk humbly before God and with each other. So Paul humbly acknowledges that God used someone who, from, from an earthly perspective, you could, if you could have guessed who would have been bringing in this new administration, you wouldn't have said the Apostle Paul. You wouldn't have said Saul of Tarsus. But that's precisely the person that God knew would have the biggest impact. This enemy of the Gentiles, this enemy of the cross, would be the very one who would bring in this new, amazing gospel administration. And Paul then explains that God had a much wider purpose and audience in mind when he unveiled the structure hidden beneath the veils of history and prophecy and the scaffolding of the old Jewish administration, verses 10 and 11. His intent, God's intent, was that now, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Do you sometimes stop and think, really? Us, the church, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known to the rulers and authorities through what Christ does here amongst us. Are we that significant? Well, we are in the sight of God and in his purposes, aren't we? We're the people of God. This is a tremendous uh, blessing and responsibility to be Christians uh, in this New Testament era. And God not only wanted to reveal his purpose in and through the church to the church and to the unbelieving world around it, but he wanted to reveal it to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. Why? Well, the things of salvation are of immense interest to the angels of God, aren't they? Remember what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 10 and 12, concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, 
when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. The angels care. They are interested, considerably more interested than probably many Christians in what is going on in the church. What these things mean. Getting their heads around it. Soaking up the scriptures. And wanting to know the mysteries of God being revealed. Because it's to men that he reveals it. And the angels catch up. They follow on after. They look in and see what God is doing. But not only to the angels does he want to reveal the secrets of this mystery of grace, but to the demonic powers also. Why? Colossians 2, 13 and 15. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh... God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. He's disarmed the powers and authorities. All of hell raging against Christ and his people, the church. And what can they do to us? This side of Calvary. What can they do? He's disarmed them. Because he removed the fear and the power of death over his people through his own death. What can these powers and authorities threaten us with now that Christ has removed the sting of death. Nothing, is there? Nothing that can harm us. And it's it's a public spectacle. Through this cross, the foolishness of the cross and the foolishness of preaching the cross, that he reveals how he has secured the victory for all those who put their faith and trust in Christ. Not only that, but because of this victory that Christ has won on our behalf, we have direct and unrestricted access to God. Verse 12. In him, and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Freedom and confidence. Does that describe our prayer life as individuals, as a church? Do we feel a sense of freedom as we come into the presence of God. That doesn't mean a carelessness. We stand on holy ground when we pray to God, but a freedom, because we're speaking to who? Our Father, who loves us, who cares more than anything for us. Freedom. Are we taking advantage of the freedom that we have in prayer? Are we being too timid when God wants us to be bold in prayer? Are there things we hold back praying for? Because oh, we think maybe that's too big. That's too much to ask of God. No. Come, he says, with freedom and confidence. So point number two, a prayer for power, verses 14 to 19. Having revealed to the Ephesians the great mystery of the grace of God revealed in the gospel, Paul now wants them to experience the corresponding power of God in their lives so that they uh, fully live out the experience, the blessings of this gospel of grace. And he addresses his prayer to the Father, verse 14. For this reason I kneel before the Father. It's to the Father that we principally address our prayers. The head of the Godhead. And we come to him through his Son, by his Spirit. But he bows his knee to the Father. And Jews normally stood to pray. So kneeling here suggests a sense of urgency. What Paul prays for these believers is for them to receive something that is absolutely 
necessary for them to experience the depths of God's amazing grace. Bows before the Father, kneels before him. He's pleading on our behalf for these things. In verse 15, Paul describes God as the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. Or what does he mean? Well, he's speaking of the Father of the believers on earth and the Father of the believers who are already with God in heaven. There's no difference to God. They're both in his presence, one directly, one on earth. The same family. We are of the Father. Those believers who have gone before us are alive. They're disembodied souls, but they're alive. They're with the Father. Remember how Jesus spoke uh, to prove that life beyond the grave was proof of the resurrection. Remember what he says in, in Luke 20. But those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. And they can no longer die, for they are like the angels. They are God's children, since they are children of the resurrection. But in the account of the burning bush, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. So those loved ones that we have, they've, they've gone before us. We're not with them in, in, a, in a physical way, but they are there with the Father in glory, as alive to God as, as we are. They'll get their resurrection bodies, um, as we will in due course. But we're all part of the family of God, separated by uh, time and, and physically. We are bound to this earth, but they're not. They're with the, the Father in glory. But we're all part of this wonderful family of God. So of all the things that Paul could ask the Father to give to the Ephesians, what does he pray? What does he ask the Father to do for them? Well, is he primarily concerned for their physical or their spiritual welfare and flourishing? Verse 16. I wonder if we'd pray like this, or if we do pray like this. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. He wants the power of God, the power of the Spirit, to really be at work in our inner being, the very core of our existence. He doesn't pray first and foremost for their healing, does he? As if that was God's top priority for them. No, he prays that they would know the power of God unleashed in their innermost being through the Holy Spirit from the glorious riches of the Father. And to what end? Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I wonder if you've ever thought to yourself, it sounds like a, a strange thing to pray for, that Christ may dwell in their hearts through faith. Don't, isn't he addressing believers? Doesn't Christ already live in the hearts of believers? What is he getting at? Why is he praying this? Why is it so important? And we often hear of this idea of Christ living in the heart in uh, an evangelistic context, don't we? Um, preachers or evangelists may address the unconverted and say, have you received Christ into your heart? Will you receive Christ into your heart? But the gospel is never actually presented in the Bible that way. What are non-Christians told to do? Repent and believe. Repent and believe. 
But Paul here is praying that Christ may dwell in the hearts of people who are already believers. So what does he mean? Why would he ask this? What does he actually want them to experience? Commenting on this verse, R.C. Sproul says this, Christ should live not at the periphery, but at the very centre of their life. Christ should live not at the periphery, not around the edges, but at the very centre of their life. I don't want you to name any names, but have you ever had uh, anybody in your home, a guest you've invited, and then uh, you've felt, after a while, perhaps only a short while, I think they've outstayed their welcome already. (laughs) I'm already looking forward to their departure. Well, how do we feel about Christ occupying the home of our hearts? More importantly, how does Christ feel about how we respond to his occupancy? I wonder, does Christ feel like an unwanted guest in our hearts? What do you think? Or does he see our hearts as places where he can truly dwell? Not merely as a visitor, but as the Lord of our life. Do we consider that our hearts are a permanent dwelling where Christ is not just tolerated, either with a kind of awkwardness or or a cold indifference, but that he's at the very centre of everything that we are and everything that we do? Well, how is it that Christ can dwell in our hearts? How How does he get there? Verse 17, by faith. It's setting our minds, our thoughts upon him in prayer and in the reading of his word. It's structuring our lives around his laws, his gospel mission, his priorities. And what is it that can sustain this intimate relationship with Christ? What sustains your relationship with Christ? Mine. Is it duty? Is it duty? Do we find the Christian life really a matter of duty? It's a hard slog. It's a tough road. But I've got to do it. So I'll do it. Duty. Well, that's not a bad motivation, is it? We, we admire people that act with duty. But it's not the best. It's not the best motivation. I'm sure a a husband or a wife here hopes that it's more than mere duty that keeps your marriage healthy. I I carry on in this relationship out of pure duty. Our relationship is a wonderful experience of duty. (laughs) Well, it might be at times, but surely there's something better. And Paul knows that, and so he prays for a yet more excellent way, verses 17 to 19. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. When we make it our life's work to explore the vast dimensions of the love of Christ to us, we become progressively rooted in it and become like that tree in Psalm 1, planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. And whatever we do prospers because we're rooted in the love of Christ. 
But Paul says we're not only rooted, but we are established or grounded upon the rock of the love of Christ. He combines a, an agricultural term, being rooted, with a, an architectural illustration, uh, in being established or grounded or, or having the foundations built. So we're not only putting down deep roots into the love of Christ, but we build our entire lives upon the solid foundation of his love. And so we become like the wise man that Jesus spoke of in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and, he, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. So what about us? What about our lives? What about our love for Christ and our appreciation of his love for us? Does that root us in Christ so that we become immovable? We've got that solid foundation of the knowledge of Christ's love for us that we can build our entire lives on. So the heart and soul of this relationship with God is a, is a reciprocal two-way uh, relationship and experience of love. Love. Real love. Profound love. Um, we were considering it, weren't we, at the recent prayer meeting, Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? What can separate us from the love of Christ? And... What does that knowledge do to us when we think about it? Ask yourself, does, does anything give me more confidence in life, more boldness in witness, more faithfulness in prayer, more delight in the word of God than the knowledge that we are loved by Christ with an everlasting, unbreakable, unshakable love? And then how are we to respond to that love? We're to meet it with love, aren't we? It's the only reasonable thing to do. Such love coming to us. Well, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus was asked this, wasn't he? What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Does God love us in that way? Do we love him back in that way? And we don't. And so often, the church down the centuries hasn't. And this is why the absence of that love or the lessening of that love, is so obnoxious to God and devastating to the church. Do you remember in the book of Revelation, the first issue that the Lord Jesus deals with when he's addressing the seven churches? Do you remember? What was the first thing? He dealt with a church that had lost its first love. Revelation 2, verse 4, Yet I hold this against you. Well, that's serious, isn't it? That's accountability. What did he hold against them? Some doctrinal error? Some fall into immorality? No. Not in their case. They were theologically sound and morally upright. So what was the issue? Revelation 2 verse 4. You have forsaken the love you had at first. And which church was Jesus addressing? The Ephesian church. The church at Ephesus. The church to whom Paul is writing. He's telling them to experience the vastness of of Christ, this ocean of his love, to measure its dimensions, its immeasurable dimensions.
No church had ever been given such clear teaching and exhortation around the appreciation of the love relationship between Christ and his church and the Ephesians. I know we've mentioned Romans 8, but when you look at how much the, this relationship between Christ and his church and the love that, that should exist and that certainly exists from Christ's side, no one, no church had their privileges like the church at Ephesus to receive this truth and these exaltations. And yet, <coughs> look how they ended up. They left their first love. The local church is the sum of its parts. If we individually lose our first love and we drift into formality and slack off church attendance and don't consider the prayer meeting the holy place of intimate, loving communion between Christ and his church, then that virus will infect the whole church and down we will fall. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. Now why would God bless such a church? What was his clear warning to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2? Apart from blessing the church, he said he will close it unless there is repentance. Revelation 2.5 Consider how far you have fallen. Serious sin to lose our first love. Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. When love was in its first flushes, when we felt excitement about being a Christian and longing to be involved in Christ's work, bolding, sharing the gospel, and loving to meet with God's people. When we didn't look for a way to excuse ourselves from active participation in the work of Christ, but we wanted it, we desired it. So how is it with us today? Honestly, as we assess our own hearts, how is it with us? What state is our heart in? How would we grade our level of love for Christ? Or well, to put it another way, how does the Christian we are today compare with the Christian we were when first we knew the Lord? Jesus says to the Ephesian church and to us as individuals and as members of Verwood Road Chapel, if this is true of us, if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So what will it be, Church of Ephesus? Church at Three Cross. Repentance and crying out for personal and corporate revival? Or will we continue in indifferent, passionless Christianity that will close our doors and shut out the gospel light so desperately needed by this community. But if we feel convicted about that, a lack of love, that we've lost our first love, we may feel very much that burden, and yet we may feel that we are powerless to do anything in the face of such a challenge. We don't, we don't feel that we've got anything we come to the end of our finite resources. We may look towards the peak of that great mountain of repentance. And we may feel like I did at times on Mount Kilimanjaro, looking up at the challenge and thinking, I, I, I have nothing in the tank. That looks like an impossible thing to achieve. And we see this, the cold state of our hearts, but we feel, I, I feel powerless to change it. What are we to do? Well, we're not to look to ourselves, are we, for strength? That's not what we're, where we're going to get the strength and the help that we need. We're powerless. 
That's why Paul prays for strength to the Ephesians in their inner man. And that's why he says in verse 20 and 21, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. What do we do? Who, who do we turn to when we don't have the things that we need? We pray to God. He has the power, doesn't he? He has the power we need. The power we know is beyond our reach and that only God can provide. But we come in humility and in repentance and he will graciously restore to us our first love. And then once restored, we'll no longer experience that meagre spiritual appetite, but we'll long to be filled with all the fullness of God. is that an amazing verse? Amazing phrase, to be filled with all the fullness of God. Why would we be content with small things when we can be filled to the measure of the fullness of God? And then we, along with the rest of the saved community, we will be a church in which the glory of Christ shines. Here, now, in time, but for all eternity. Amen.